<laughs> okay, good evening, Vietnam. This is live from LZ Bunker, Veterans Live Show. Tonight, we were speaking with the award-winning producer of the documentary Back to China Beach, Mike Cotton. Mike and I will discuss how the beach boosted morale, gave the troops a bit of peace among the chaos around them, and the story of a group of Vietnam veterans who returned to China Beach and how the experience helped them heal the wounds of decades past. We'll get to the show in a minute, but first I'd like to let you know that the program is brought to you by the Vietnam Veterans book, Fallen Never Forgotten. You can visit fallenneverforgotten.com for that and to purchase it or to get more information. Thank you. And how you doing, Mike? I'm doing good. All right. So how many of you brothers made it to China Beach? Let's hear about it. your time there. Let's go, guys. I never knew they had a sign, China Beach. Paul Tavares. Took a swim several times. Nice. Next. Al Markley. Three-day country in-country R&R. &R. Chance to heal up, get the stitches out so he can go back to the field. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Good thanks, Al. Next. Paul Tavares again. Took a swim several times. That's a lot of swims there, Paul. Next one, J.J. Matia, friends visited in 2016, a tad different. Thank you, J.J. Wow, look at the palm trees, which looks like Miami Beach over here, or maybe even better. Probably is. Okay, let's go talk about your project, Mr. Mike. Well. What, what you brought you into this world? Pardon? How'd you get into the Vietnam subject? The Vietnam uh, was something, and, and China Beach, in fact, I heard, started to hear these stories uh, back when I was a teenager in South Florida in the 60s. And some of the older ones were coming back, and we were all surfers. And one told me a story of going to Cameron Bay, because there was other beaches besides China Beach. Oh, for China sure. Beach yeah. is, is just the most famous, and it has good surf, and there's, but there's a lot of other spots as well. And um, I just thought it was amazing. This guy ended up, had a wound and uh, they decided not to send him home and heard he was a lifeguard in Fort Lauderdale. He ended up being a lifeguard at Cameron Bay for six months and dodged rockets all the time. So I began to hear these stories and I began to ask questions and I've always been a, a student of history and, and always interviewing people and trying to find out what, what really happened, what's the real story. You got any photographs of it? You got any eight millimeter film? So time went on, and um, most of us know about Apocalypse Now when that film came out. And uh, maybe it's not all true, but some is true. You guys were there. I wasn't. But the thing about surfing in battle, uh, that did happen uh, to a point, maybe not exactly the way it was in that film. And um, so when I moved to Pensacola and hooked up with Dave Barnes, I began to tell him these stories and the TV show in 88 came out china beach and a lot of people don't know the tv show is actually the the consultants to the show were vietnam veterans this was not like even though mash was a funny uh, film, a tv show great writers i don't think it was too accurate as what they were doing in the korean war right, uh, yeah. Yeah. but it was it was entertaining right but china beach the tv show did try uh, and, and there's, and I'm going to give locations people can go to and see some of the stuff. I have a clip of an interview that Larry Martin, who was one of our main consultants, who many people consider Mr. China Beach, because he was the guy that really organized the surf club there and got things really going uh, for the soldiers when they came there for R&R &R and made it easy for them. Um, but he was on there with Brian Wimmer, and that night they were doing a, a show juxtaposed to, ve to veterans telling the real story and they were depicting the story in that particular episode. So when I moved to Pensacola and finally it took me several years to get my co-producer interested, he was from Chicago. You know, he didn't know a wave from a, a whack, let's say. <laughs> he, he just, <laughs> but I, you know, surfers are kind of an interesting breed because no matter where we go, if we see waves, we'll figure out how to make a board, get a board. Well, wait a minute. In that water, a know? wave or a whack. That could be somebody in the Navy or the Air Force. Yes, that could be. Thank and, you. <laughs> and I do a lot of work out at NAS Pensacola. We can All right. I got boat. you. And uh, so we, I heard that Larry Martin, who I'd heard about and read about, lived in Pensacola. 
And uh, there was uh, uh, a big event down at the beach one day and somebody came running down and I was filming uh, another film, interviewing people. Somebody said, Larry Martin's up the beach. And I, and I says, well, how do I know him? They go, he was in a crowd, but he's about six, five, you know, having a leather jacket with a gigantic China beach surf club patch on the back. <laughs> so, you know, I'm like five, eight, five, nine. I'm up there pulling on his jacket going, Hey, Mr. Mr. I want, he, he looked he turned around and looked at me and he goes, I'm not interested. I go, you're not interested in what? He says, I'm too old. I don't have the time. I says, I already know your story, Larry. And I know you've been going around for 20, 25 years, taking interviews and telling this story. We're talking about making a damn movie. We're talking about Dave and I investing our spare time, our money, but we can't do it unless somebody like you would get involved because, you know, we're, we're documentarians, we're journalists. It has to be accurate. We don't want to make a fool out of ourselves either. So finally, I think Larry's wife convinced him, get on board. And we became friends and Larry to this day. In fact, he's my, he's my assistant in my business. And he began to pull out memorabilia and letters. And um, Larry actually worked in depot down the road at night. And somebody told him about China Beach, which is the beach at Da Nang. And by the way, today that's called Mikey Beach. The Vietnamese aren't real happy with the Chinese, so they really don't like that name. But yeah, I can see that. We may have to change the name when we go, when we show it over there because we'd like to do a goodwill tour. But uh, so he went down there, and the whole place was a disaster. There's boards laying all over. The lifeguards didn't care. Guys from Arkansas were paddling out. No offense, but they were getting hit in the head with the surfboards. And you know, the joke was, what if you came back in a bag and been killed by a surfboard in Vietnam? be a hell of a way to you know, serve your country. So he convinced uh, the powers to be to let him organize it. They built the infamous uh, surf shack. He created a club. He uh, tested people. So if they didn't know how to surf, they would get some lessons or not go out at all. So um, all that started to come to us. And then we began to network through social media everywhere we could go. And, um, going moving forward because it took us about three years to put this all together we began to get people from all the country and out of country contacted us with photographs some film uh, unfortunately everybody had a 35 millimeter camera i guess is what i understand over there but not many people had a movie camera so the the actual film other than national archives combat film a military film is is not that available so we began to build a story um from really the mid 60s when this began to happen going really into the early 70s when the ceos went in there and said tear it all down it's over and all these little stories in there i probably talked to 200 vietnam veterans that had some sort of interaction with that beach or the other beaches and all their different stories uh we probably interviewed about 75 or 80 and about 30 have made it into the film um so it's, uh, it's a combination of current interviews, uh, a lot of photographs, some moving pictures from that era as well. And then we finally got the film together to where we wanted to show it. You, you want to put, did we, did we look at the trailer? We didn't have that on the air, right? No, could we? Yeah, yeah, there we go. yeah this. In 1967, when I got to uh, China Beach, and I found that they had a few surfboards there, and I was very excited. It, it was one of the things that kind of reminded me of being home and made me feel a little bit, you know, not so lost in a foreign country. 
But China Beach was, uh, it was a gift from heaven. You know, I mean, the whole surfing thing was a blessing. Well, it was going to rain that night, so I thought, until I was enlightened by someone who said, Carol, not lightning, incoming. So welcome to Vietnam. When for the first time ever, we had clubs in a war zone. We had never done that before. And, uh, and I think Honcho today is probably the first dog that ever went surfing in Vietnam. And we could see um, Monkey Mountain in the background look like Diamond Head in Hawaii. So you could almost feel like you were on vacation there. There's something about the water and maybe our connection with the water that not only brings the child out in us, but maybe the hope out in us. Since the first time I came back in 1998, I've seen a world of change here. When I first came back, it looked like we had just left. The villages were just like they were when we left. Our base was still there, just like it was when we left, because nothing else had worked. Over the years, we met a, a dozen guys who had surfed in Vietnam, and they said, if it hadn't been for surfing when I came back from Vietnam, I don't know what my life would have been like, but it wouldn't have been good. That was excellent, man. That's pretty cool. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. We filmed right itself in. about an hour and ten minutes. Um, we do have we have added in Rocky Blyer, if people know him from the Pittsburgh Steelers. Right. Yeah. Uh, Rocky is a Bronze Star winner. I never knew this. Somebody sent me a video he did with for ESPN about a year ago. He went back to Vietnam where he was injured, and it was a pretty pretty emotional uh, short documentary. And uh, I was able to talk to the producer at ESPN. I said, you know, we've tried to get, we want a celebrity to open the film, introduce the film. We tried to get to Gary Sinise. Uh, he wasn't available at the time. Mark Wahlberg, who has a connection in the area where I live, who also supports a lot of veterans causes. Um, but somebody sent me this. I talked to the producer. He says, here's Rocky's cell phone number. I says, well, you know, I don't want to do anything out of line here. He goes, call him. Tell him I said to call. Call him. Rocky said, send me a clip. And uh, the next day he said, what do you want me to do? I said, I want you to do about a one minute. I'm going to send you the film, the whole thing. And then if you like it, I'd like for you to just do an intro, you know, add some, you know, authenticity to the film of an actual veteran that was there. That's also a football hero. But um, uh, he goes around the country now. You're going to play that now, Pardon? Yeah, you're gonna play that, you're gonna play that now? Oh, you got it. Yeah, yeah. There you go. The film, that's the, kind of, the real story is told by veterans who were there and how many found a little bit of happiness and home at the beaches of Vietnam. Also what their life has been like for the past 50 years. Now, many veterans tell their stories for the first time in this film. Back to China Beach is the real story told from the heart. That's great. Good for you. Thank you. He has a great story. I mean, he was told he would walk, but part of his foot was blown off. He was a running back. And had yeah. just been drafted by the Steelers. Right. But Art Rooney loved him. And when he came back, he said, you know, I'll give you a shot. And he worked his butt off. And uh, I don't know if he has some sort of prosthesis or whatever, but uh, he was uh, a couple years later, won four Super Bowls with Terry Bradshaw and Frank yeah. Lair bad backfield. So <laughs> he's uh, he's a great inspiration, you know, particularly to veterans, you know. Yeah, desire, desire to cannot stop you sometimes. Absolutely. So good for him. That's great. Welcome so home, we, Rocky. Yeah, we're going to look at some photos. Right, we're going to look at some oh, photos okay. now. We'll do our All photo right. club. All right, All let's right. shoot it. This, oh, is, this, uh, this is actually, um, we have a, we work with a surf shop over there. In fact, the whole story of us going over there to film was, is pretty uh, pretty funny and interesting. But that's actually Monkey Mountain. Uh, any of the veterans uh, probably don't recognize it if they haven't been back, but it, that was all defoliated. Uh, they did have a TV and a radio station on top of there. And that's a big uh, kind of Buddhist temple thing up top. And it's real beautiful. Uh, but that's China, standing right on China Beach right there on a nice glassy day. Nice. Yeah. 
this of course uh probably rocket hit back there somewhere that would be looking back towards where camp tenshaw was i believe that's where that that would have been the way that picture is which a lot of guys knew marvel and uh yeah that's that's right out in front of the the surf shack and uh kind of funny i had like pine trees there this guy here sent me this picture he wasn't a surfer but he says i got this picture and i think it's it's a good picture. I said, send it to me. So I never been on a board. It's a classic Vietnam surfboard. Yeah. Got this Vietnam flag on it. That's yeah. great. Rick, Rick Holt is his name. He lives up in uh, New England, I think, somewhere, Ohio. <laughs> never been on a board. <laughs> that's, that's terrific. <laughs> yeah, but he impressed his girlfriend. Yeah. Now, this yeah. is, of course, China Beach from Monkey Mountain. Uh, looking back the other way, south uh, towards uh, Marble Mountain would be way down the other end of the beach. A lot of guys were stationed down there and we do talk a lot about marble mountain in that area as well yeah but right there in the middle was uh, this is on top of monkey mountain i'm not really going to get into what boom boom rock i didn't know what it was but now i do and uh it was just sort of a uh, a moment of uh, of passage for young men that well that's a little lot of uh big, uh pretty good view from up there too it's uh they actually found it's all grown up now and uh ronnie ratliff who was our guide over there uh Navy veteran. He they went one year and he he takes bets back and he said, "Yeah, we dug it. We found it. We cut some bushes back. And we actually found it." Wow. This would be uh, I don't know if that's the PX there. That's more that's security. They had a R &R, great R and R center. <laughs> yeah, they had a great PX at China Beach. And we have one guy in the film. He bought a GTO there. Of course, people thought he got it in Vietnam. He had it was waiting for him when he got home. <laughs> oh wow! But uh, this guy here, forget his name. Some guys call me to have a like a veterans yoga group and they wanted to know who this guy was and i says i don't know but the picture's been sent to me by a dozen different people and they uh, i need to get back with them they found who this guy was and i don't think he's alive they got the parents to allow them to put that image on i have a t-shirt here i tried to show but it didn't show up uh of him on it but that's a famous picture of the guy in his you know in his fatigues ready to go to Good battle man, that's nice just kids you know what can you say about this picture yeah. Just babies, you know, these kids are right out of high school, maybe even more in high school. Perhaps Blue Ribbon, that's the beer of Vietnam. That was it, you know, and that's back again. <laughs> oh, God, yeah. Everywhere I, I go. I went, I went it. to Nashville about a few, I keep going there every few yeah. years, whatever. But well, I drank a lot of Tiger beer. There's 33s over there, but I drank a lot. Tiger, of tiger, beer. tiger, tiger beer. beer? Oh, yeah, yeah. And Bami Ba? In the meantime, I uh, that, but what was the other 30, 33? Was that yeah, the other Bami Ba. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. What were they saying about the? Uh, 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 I forgot it. That doesn't matter. That happens. This is uh, the Surf Shack expanded over time. Uh, Larry Martin, who was our main consultant, he's throughout. He's in the film all over it, uh, telling the progression of this. But that ended up being like a big warehouse building. They actually, in the end, were building surfboards right there. They did best they could in that shack. For repairs and they did build a few but eventually they saw the officer saw that this was such a good thing and a fun thing you know they got everybody what they needed in order in the way of materials and i've got one picture in the film where guys standing in there with probably 50 surfboards all lined up where they're it's a factory yeah that's ronnie uh this is the first day we're on china beach which is uh, mikey beach uh, as vietnamese call it that's monkey mountain in the background and I'm standing next to Dave's running the camera. And right behind me is two secret police. I asked Ronnie, I says, are those cops? He goes, this is the secret police. They've been following us since the hotel. Um, I will confess, we did not check with the State Department here. And we did not check in over there. No permits. We went in as a bunch of rednecks having a family reunion in Vietnam. And we these cameras, they look like they're still cameras. But they shoot, they shoot 4K, 6K film. So. Does he know who that guy served with? The, that guy was a civilian, right? This guy here? No, no, he was Navy. He worked on the oh, dock. Okay. In fact, he's from Texas and he's in, he's got some great parts in the film as well, but he was our guy. Uh, we, we had gotten turned on to him by somebody else out West and they hooked us up with Ronnie and I got to talk to him and he says, well, about twice a year, he says, I take groups over of vets and uh, here's one of his groups. And um, he actually finds uh former North Vietnamese soldiers, and I guess Viet Cong, and they actually meet and go have dinner with these guys. That's and, crazy. That's and he, crazy. And he says they, they, those guys, 
the, the, the Vietnamese veterans, and these aren't from the South. I mean, even though there's a lot of, in the South, they love us for sure. But they would just tell them, you know, just get over it. it it's in the past. And we were doing what we were told to do because if we didn't do it, you know, we're out of here. So, you know, they said, and you were doing what you were told to do. So that's just the way it is in war. And across the board, most experiences are these people are very forgiving across the board. I mean, there's yeah. now this lady, she, you saw her in the um, in the um, in the trailer. That's Carol Law. She lives in Pensacola. She was the manager of the USO club at China Beach. That was the first USO really? club That's ever in a, in a combat zone. First time. Yeah. Ever. And she worked with uh, Joey Heatherton. And in fact, that little flyer she's showing, she went back. The first uh, uh, a Goodwill tour was with Joey Heatherton. And that's Joey Heatherton in that picture. You can't really see it. But she went yeah, back yeah. Uh, there. And they, they wanted to plant a tree. And, and the Vietnamese government said, no, no. So all the girls put dirt in their pockets and they went over there and they had little seeds and they put dirt out somewhere and they planted an American tree there somewhere. <laughs> but uh, yeah, she was over there and uh, the fun, her story was a whole nother angle because she's there. She's getting the guys flip flops, surf trunks, you know, hamburgers, whatever they need. Right. Be happy for one to three days. And uh, you know, there's a lot of guys like Larry were stationed there. They worked there every day, but um, she, uh, her story was, her husband was a Marine fighter pilot. Was that F-4s maybe they were flying? Phantom? And, yeah. And um, yeah. He, was, uh, he was quite up the ladder. And the joke in her family was she got sent to Vietnam with the USO in a combat zone, and he stayed back and, and taught. <laughs> so he, he never went to Vietnam, but she did. And, you know, there was, you know they were shooting rockets down there. Was, there was rock, They called it Rocket City, Da Nang, from what everybody told Oh, for sure, yeah. That's what it looks like today. That's China Beach. Yeah, when I went to, I, I can't believe that. That's crazy. I yeah, had a, um, a country R and R to Vung Tao, which was I couldn't yes. achieve it. Couldn't that's achieve where, it. But, that's but where Ronnie was, Ratliff moved. When Ronnie went out there, he he was going to the VA. He had psychological issues, and a buddy of his said, "Man, they're not going to do nothing for you here. You need to go back to Vietnam." And Ronnie's like, "That's the last place I want to go." No. And the guy goes. His friend goes, I, I thought that too. I went back there and it was a, it, I had a healing. He said, not everybody has it, but he said, I, I got with the people. I interacted. I spent about a month of there. So Ronnie goes over. He hid in his hotel room for a couple of weeks. Then he got out and started walking around Da Nang, a different place. And uh, he ended up staying three years. He moved, got a house down. Is Vung Tao, is that where you were? Vung Tao, yeah. Yeah, Vung Tao. Okay. It got a house. He lived there. For, they got married. She came back. They live in Oklahoma now. And uh, uh, that was kind of how he got interested in spreading the message to other veterans that you might want to give this a try. It could, and he does one little thing where they gather around a fire on the beach. How can they find where to watch this, the documentary? Okay. The best thing to do, what we're doing right now, we decided, um, I mean, the plan was at the end of 2019, we had a huge premiere in Pensacola, 250 people, over 100 Vietnam veterans. Um, we didn't know what the reaction would be, but when the veterans started coming up to us with tears in their eyes and hugging me and the co-producer, we, we've said, you know what, I think we did, we done good. And their families came up and said, you know, you put a whole puzzle together because we've been hearing the stories for 50 years. So the, the plan was I had already started to book private screenings around uh, Florida and the Southeast where uh, we could, different ways we partner with vet groups or whatever, it could be a fundraiser, but it's more about uh, if they have a group like your book and what you do, it can, you could get a lot of promotion out of this. So we began to do these screenings. We opted not to go on um, uh, online to Netflix or Amazon or any of that. Not saying we won't, because we will eventually. And we got about four or five uh, gigs down the road. We got called back to Pensacola uh, to enter the Pensacola Film Fest, which we didn't even know it was a contest. We won that. We beat, we became, we were the best film of the festival. We beat Parasite, who had just won four Academy Awards. And this festival is voted on by the, by the viewers, not necessarily a, a professional, the people that were there. Right, yeah. And so that meant a lot to us. Not the, not the in crowd. It, not the in crowd. Well, the judges are, they're involved in it, but they got to vote like everybody else. So a Tuesday following the festival, 
they sent us an email and said, congratulations, you won best film of the festival. We're like that blew our mind. Unfortunately, we couldn't parlay on that real quick because then the COVID came and people would have us, they book us, but nobody's going to show up. So we spent a year, we tinkered with the film some more. We actually, the film is the third version called the director's cut, probably the final version. And we're back out now. So, um, what we're doing is we're booking the film primarily with vet groups uh, where we can get a venue. Um, all kinds of projection systems are out there and we, we partner together to promote it and we come to town and it's, it's an event. So if there's somebody there that can speak with us on uh, at the podium about it, uh, there's a meet and greet. Uh, if it's in an area where I have people that are in the film or production people, they come out. So it's not just a film. It's an event. How, so, how big is this uh, venue needed to be to do this? Because we, we, like, have we have a we have a reunion at, at West Point every perfect. winter to, for, called the Bastogne Banquet. Hunter for Sabon Division yeah. recognizes the, the, what they did back in World War II, and uh, they're, they're our predecessors, obviously. So we could get 100, 200 people in it. Is that 50, enough? 50 to 100 people. If we're on the road, if we're, if we're, uh, if we're doing like uh, – uh, when I was a traveling musician, we have what we call routing dates. So yeah. you're willing to go in and take a little more of a risk if you're already going past that town anyway on a whatever night yeah. uh, and you need a gig. So, you know, 50 to 100 people is is respectable. They usually charge, you know, 10 or $12 to That's come fine. get yeah, a donation so or whatever. Yeah. But I had, when by the time the premiere was over, the end of 2019, by the January of 2020, I had about 18 dates lined up from Miami all the way to Boston on the East coast. Right. And I was already starting to work on the West coast. You saw the lady in the film. That was the California surf history museum who we worked with and went out there three different times to film. And ironically, I walked in there about four years ago when I looked like we were going to do this film. And I went to the museum with my son who was living out there. And I put my business card on the desk. The guy was there and says, you guys really should do an exhibit. Uh, kind of like the film we're doing. And I told him, he goes, the guy almost fell over. He goes, how did you know? And I was like, how do I know what? He goes, how did you know we've just voted to do a Vietnam surfing exhibit in the museum? <laughs> we got, I had, I had and it no, wasn't yours. It wasn't it yours. It wasn't ours. It's just an exhibit. <laughs> that exhibit went up. The biz, biggest exhibit they ever had. It was going to stay up six months. It's up a year and a half. It went on the road. COVID shut it down. It's made it as far. It's in storage with the Texas Surf Museum. And, Corpus Christi, and they just call me, and they're getting ready to bring it out of mothballs. And, uh, oh, that's great. And, and Larry Martin in our film, he helped them design the whole exhibit. Which is all right. We're going to get back to that sooner or later, but we're going to yeah. do our little Q and A now. Sure. You ready? Okay. Let's fire away. Kevin Blackburn, seventy fifth Ranger Regiment, eighty four to two thousand. You have a question or comment, Kevin? Okay. Next. Marie Kenmer, thank you for your service for Marie. The Hootis, what, what the heck is Hootis? Okay. Where She's asking about the lady in the film. Oh, I got you, girl from Vietnam. I've been right. Washington October 25th, uh, for October 15th at 2 p.m. for the Vietnam Memorial Fund Memory Program to finally honor your husband. Wow, that's terrific. Wow. James Kenmer, uh, my late sidekick, UE pilot. Ronnie, Mike, and Harry Adams, too. I love everything you do. Keep the Facebook on YouTube going. Thank right. you very much, Marie. Be, I'll be in touch about that. Thanks. Yeah, the lady, the lady, uh, as we were just talking about, is yeah. uh, Carol Law. She was with the US, USO. Oh, and, great. Yes, Thank you. Terry Canavy, was at China Beach in Chulai? Was it? No. No. China Beach is Da Nang. Yeah, yeah, all right. 67 with it's the now called Mike, Mike Key Beach. Oh, Battalion. Yeah, you're not going to hear Vietnamese call anything China, was there? I but got here's the funny thing: the Chinese are the biggest tourist demographic over there right now. I hear you. <laughs> Thank you, Terry. Next, Joe Sabia. Love all the BMAF veterans before my time in '79. I don't know what that means, but I hope it's safe. Yeah. Thanks, <laughs> <John. laughs> Tim Hodge, never, right made, never made it to Channel. China Beach or even Eagle Beach. Oh, I remember Eagle Beach. Yes. Yes. 101st was there. Uh, 
way too short-handed. I almost made it to Bob Hope show at Camp Eagle. Yeah, I was there too, uh, but ended up not getting go due to being short-handed. Thank you, Tim. Yeah, I, that's why I went to Bung Tao. <laughs> yeah, I'll yeah. post on my Facebook pages. I should have sent y'all. It's a map the California Surf Museum did of all those beaches uh, on the coast of Vietnam. You can send it to us. We'll post yeah. it on the page. Yeah, yeah, yeah. just send it. Right. Got it. We'll post it on the page, the Vietnam Veterans Photo Club. Okay, John Sabia, any Vietnam vets in Connecticut? No, but I live 20 miles away. There you go. I know one, John Rowe, 101st Airborne Division. John Rowe, R-O-W, lives in uh, – uh, I'll get back to you on that, John. <laughs> Patrick Blelzer. I got to swim in both ends of China Beach when I was in Vietnam in 68 and 69, and when I was in Korea in 67. It was so awesome. God bless you all. This old Vietnam vet is fighting Parkinson's from Agent Orange. I'm still hanging in there. Hawk Hill, 1st Armored Cav Division, Headquarters Company, Tet, 6869, America Division. God bless you all. And God bless you, Patrick. Get God well soon, sir, brother. Okay, welcome home. Next, John Sabia. We love all you old school fellow veterans. <laughs> what the hell does that mean? What, what are we? What are the guys from World War II? Dust. <laughs> Next. <Yeah. laughs> Thank you. That's what we try to do, John. We try to get the real guys on here to do the real deal. This is not Hollywood. This is uh, the neighborhood. All right. Let me take you on a tandem jump in my DZ in Connecticut. I'm going, John. I'm going to Normandy uh, in June, and I have to go to Florida to do some uh, uh, jumps. So uh, we'll talk about it. Talk to me on Facebook. Thank you. Okay, next. Keep all the historic stories coming. Never forgotten. Amen to that. All right, that's it. There you go. That's that's really a, a lot of my motivation. Um, because in music, my my passion in music is the blues and American roots music and the music that if the younger people don't come up and, and do something with it, it dies. So it's just like these stories. Uh, our film is is a vehicle to keep the stories in perpetuity forever uh, because we don't want people to forget and it seems like it's taken 50 years to get the real story out about Vietnam. I mean, I we have a lot of kids, middle schoolers, their parents bring them the film. I said, well, you know, we've got some combat in there and stuff. They said, we don't care because they don't learn anything about this in school and I want them to talk to these veterans and see this film. And Yeah, so, well so, said. Yeah, I appreciate it. It's entertaining, right. but it's educational. Too. You're right about that. So. You know, it's weird. You, you, you say, and I say, and I think all the time, and I try not to think, and I say, wow, 50 years. That's like a long time, man. You know what I mean? Yeah, okay. I'm 73 now. And, like, you know, the Civil War was only 80 years or something before I was born. And it's already 50 years out. Of, I'm 50 years out of this war. Yeah. It's like, you know what I mean? It's like crazy how stuff goes on. And it, yeah. stuff, Go ahead. It's now, I mean, the... There's parts, there's a lot of dimensions of this film. You know, I think it's it's like a lot of projects in the arts and other things too, but you start out with an idea and, you know, we didn't want to make this the PTSD film in a way. Right. We just felt like this was going to be lighthearted, a bunch of goofballs like myself that are like my, you know, they're at, there's, there's stuff going on, but these guys are going to have, they're going to pull pranks. They're going to go surfing. They're going to go, they're going to go a little crazy. Um, and, and we got all of that. But as we began to talk to these veterans, the, 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 whatever it was, the seven or eight years that this was happening in Vietnam became a 50 to 55 year story. So yeah. many of these guys, we actually are following their stories from when they were 17 or 18 years old. And now they're in their late sixties, early seventies. We, in fact, we have Joe Savelli in the film who's 84. He flew the last heavy helicopter out of Saigon. And he had 347 missions, never got really wounded, got shot down six times, somehow made it out of there. He was, when they had that, that scene where there's like a hundred Vietnamese and yeah. flying, the babies, that's his, he's flying that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Korski, I guess. Yeah, out of the top of the hotel. Yeah. So it just, you know, so what, what's happened is, yeah, they're surfing. Surfers love it. A lot of surfers are older Vietnam veterans as well. We got them in the film, bunches of them. Um, but it really became uh, 
that there is hope, there is healing, even if it takes 50 years to do it. Yeah. And that's, we, we zero in on that. I mean, we have some vets that are psychologists in there, guys that are counselors, guys that were really, really messed up that have a success story to tell. And they're telling it, they're talking to their brothers in the film. Yeah, so, that's the only way to do it. I had to find, you know, I. it took me 40 years and a very serious situation to get out of what I was held in for 40 years, especially because of the friendly fire incident that my unit was involved in. And I'll tell you, it's, uh, yeah, it's not uncommon to see that happen 40, 50 years later. Uh, yeah. People get some help and they finally open up. And I, I figure that's, that's the best therapy for me and everybody else. Just stay involved the best you can with a vet unit in a vet organization. Be it American Legion, go to parades, go to parties, go to the, the VFW, go to the VVA, something or other, go to Washington, go to Arlington Cemetery. You got to face the facts, man, and it's going to help you. But, and a lot of these guys, uh, we, we have a lot of experience, particularly Dave Barnes, who I've done over 100 national news stories with him. He's probably done 1,000. But um, and we're kind of getting away from that. That's a young man's game to be out there up into your neck and floods and alligators and, you know, tornadoes or whatever. But uh, we all, we seem to get the gig where we have to go and interview the family that's lost someone. I got you. And there's a technique of bringing down the lights and cal a calming effect that he's taught me how to do. And particularly interviewing these veterans, which some never got on, in, never would interview, but there was many in there that never really talked to anybody seriously. And what we do in there is we don't ask direct questions. We ask leading questions. Right. You know, tell us about when you got there and what was what was the smell, whatever. And then we just let them go. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, you know, we've got uh, less than an hour and 15 minutes to make a film. But, you know, we've got 100 hours of these just incredible interviews that we can re-edit those later and put those out. But I always ask at the end of the interview, particularly guys that had gone through really heavy situations, how do you feel now? And almost every time they said, you know, I feel better. I feel like you guys are here to listen to my story and, and you're honoring what we're doing and you're making an effort to make it real. And that's, we've get a lot of, we've gotten a lot of compliments, but the I fact that Mike, up and I'm going to ask great. you, I'm going to tell you how you feeling about what you just talked about us. Cause we're going to have to go. I as appreciate far as it. That, yeah, <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, thank you. thank you for being on. Guys, you're and, great. Uh, we'll, we'll get your uh, links up. And this, yeah. I guess this will be in the archives. We'll get it repeated oh, on all. Absolutely. Of and, uh, people could go to Mike Cotton Productions on Facebook. Right? Yeah. Uh, just, just go there and uh, hit the like button and then you're in the loop. You can message me that way. And uh, there'll be a phone number on there if you want to call. But we are looking for dates. We're looking to get this thing out and, and heavily tour the rest of this year. And then we'll probably put it online. And you can put it on the Vietnam Veterans Photo Club page. Yeah, well, they okay. post yeah, it up there. They would let me on in the beginning because I wasn't a veteran. But when, when I explained what I was doing, no, no, yeah, it, I'm there. And then that, that other one that's the uh, best of the baby boomers. Those no, 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 Vietnam uh, Veterans Photo Club. Right, that, that's me. We yeah. got, you got it. We, yeah, yeah, you guys have been great. And uh, yeah, that's me. So Matt, my, son Matt, Matt, my, my son Matt does all the tech work. I'm just a reference here. Thank yeah. you. God bless you and welcome home, brother. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Boy, oh boy. What a story. Got one more question. Oh, we got here. John Sabia. A young vet need all your stories and have your back. Thank you. 24 7, 365. Thank you, John. War is hell. It's not fun. It sucks. But uh, yeah, try to take care of those older guys. Because one day you're going to be older. Appreciate it. God bless you. And welcome home.